Um, welcome to all of you, our allies and our women in technology. So we really appreciate you coming today to, to join us. My name is Tina Eskridge. I am the Senior Director for Cloud for All at Microsoft. My pronouns are she and her. And I'm really excited to be here today to introduce to you two very special speakers. Um, some of you may know Microsoft's mission is to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. And Satya Nadella, our CEO, always says, if we don't look like the world, we can't serve the world. So I think that you'll find that the two speakers we have today really embody what we value the most at Microsoft in kindness, courage, uh, diversity, and also inclusiveness. So our first speaker is Pamela Schmidt. Pamela's up here on stage with me, and, and I'm gonna hand it over to her in a second. And she's gonna talk a little bit more about the kindness in tech. So with no further ado, please join me in welcoming Pamela Teller. Thank you. Awesome, how is everybody doing this afternoon? Are you guys ready? ready to I know we had a little bit of delay, so um, if I talk too fast, just like start waving your hands at, you know, slow down a little bit. So, beyond the zeros and ones, what do you think that really means? Hmm, the human side of tech. So, we are in a digital transformation. I totally had to use a buzzword, but it's for real. I mean, we really are in a digital transformation age. Think about the technologies that were available, what, 10 years ago, 15, 20 years ago. Answering machines. Who, has, who still has answering machines? With the little tape, yeah. I don't see any heads going, I got one. Um, if we showed our kids that, they'd probably look at us and go, yeah, what the heck is that? So, you know, technology has evolved so much. It is the fastest changing industry out there. But with all this advancement, I mean, we're so focused on, you know, all this technology, all this change, AI, machine learning, Kubernetes, containers, all this stuff that we're doing. We, but we've forgotten about ourselves. And this is actually a topic I'm very, very passionate about. I've got a lot of stories to share and just life experiences that focus on us, the people, you because we've forgotten each other. We, we, we basically, we've been so focused on the technology that we forgot ourselves. Because without humans, there is no tech. We're the ones that build it. We, you know, we're, we're the workers in it. We, without us, there is no tech. So the human side of tech, IT, there's just so many aspects of it. So, that, you know, the 30 minutes isn't gonna give it justice. And I pretty much, pretty much narrowed it down to imposter syndrome, balance, and soft skills. These three key pillars, I like to call them, is pretty much what the industry is talking about right now. And I'm willing to bet most of you are feeling or have an idea or in one of these three pillars right now. And then we're gonna talk about inclusive and diversity. That just, to me, if you've got the top three pillars, inclusion just naturally comes. Imposter syndrome. What is imposter syndrome? Raise of hands if anybody knows what it is or is feeling it. Okay, it's pretty good. So it's the feeling of self-doubt, insecurity, like you're a fraud. I have imposter syndrome just about every day. I started at Microsoft uh, 11 months ago, so it'll be a year in July, July 23rd. And just about every day, I feel like an imposter. Why? I work with amazing people, and I'm always doubting myself. It, it's, you know, and people are like, wow, you're just, you know, you're like a rock star. I'm like, no, oh, no, no, I'm not. You know, look at the people I work with, they're rock stars. And I'm sure a lot of you in here are thinking, wow, that's actually a term, there's actually a term for what I've been feeling, because I've actually met people uh, that have felt this but didn't know what it's called. They just called it like self-doubt. In fact, when I was in Toronto giving the same talk, a woman came up after me and said, oh my God, you are, you know, that's me. I've been feeling this, but 
I didn't know what it was called. I feel validated that it was okay to feel this and others feel it. So imposter syndrome strikes people at different phases in their career um, and it strikes different ways. Usually for me, it happens um, around meetings and whatnot, but around big projects. You know, I tend to like cram up and go, wow, I'm not sure if I can do that. And then I just procrastinate and not want to do it at all. Other times it's just feeling of self-doubt when everyone's talking about all their accomplishments in their team meetings. And oftentimes it's just, you know, whenever it decides to creep up. But one thing that I've noticed though is the further along I get in my career, the more advancement, it creeps up more. I doubt myself more. And I'm wondering if a lot of you feel that way too. I got some head shaking. Yeah. And there's actually, um, there's been some scientific research on that. So most people, the further up in your career you get, you start to feel this doubt more often. So how do we overcome it? You can't. That's my, that's my saying. I, there, there's really no way of getting rid of it. You're not going to be cured of it. There's ways to beat it when you get that voice in your head. Like every morning when I get up and I join my calls, I have to reaffirm myself. I have to acknowledge it. Acknowledgement. And say, okay, here I go. What have I done to be here? I would have gotten to the place that I'm at if I hadn't made all these accomplishments. I was virtualization admin. I managed a global data center between Little Harrisburg, Pennsylvania and London. We had a small data center in uh, India. I built a whole virtualization platform. Wow, most people hadn't done it back then. And I did it by myself, blood, sweat and tears, even cut myself several times, racked and stacked the servers, long hours, lots of tears, <laughs> because I've, I've never done it before. It was actually a project that was given to me. I was an exchange administrator, and my boss pulled me in and said, you know, you have some VMware experience. The VMware experience is really just putting it on my desktop, but you know, it, it was experience, right? So there, yeah, you're gonna be our virtualization admin. You're, you're gonna be our lead admin. And I'm like, wow, yeah. I, my own experience is my desktop, but hey, you know, go for it, right? So I did some training and, uh, you know, learned and figured out how to do everything, and it took about a month. That, you know, so that experience, when I start feeling the imposter syndrome now, I think, I think back to that and go, I accomplished some big stuff. A lot of people hadn't done what I've done. And I'm a girl, <laughs> you know, I'm, that's like a double check mark for me. And I've done some huge exchange migrations, especially you know, migrating 200 terabytes of email data in less than a month. Yeah, that's a lot of emails. Even uh, the exchange product group was like, wow, that's quick. And I did that. So like, I think about these accomplishments and then I start to feel better. Like, okay, yeah, I do belong here. Because my experiences are different than my team's. And see, it would be the same for you. Your accomplishments are going to be different than somebody else's. So don't, don't look down on what you have done. Those are major accomplishments in your life. And at the moment, you are probably very, very proud of them. So. I tell people, make a list when you, you know, make, when you make these big accomplishments, make a list of it. And then go back and look at them when you're starting to feel bad, like doubt yourself. And if you don't want to write out the list, then think about all those cool things that you've done. Because you really start to think like, you know what, yeah, I deserve to be here because I work my butt off. And also you want to talk about it. Talk about it with your friends. Find someone you can confide in because most likely they're probably feeling it too at times. I know I have a group of uh, women that I speak with and 
we all have imposter syndrome. And I actually talk about with men too. And I'm so glad that there's men here in the audience because this talk is for everyone. We all, we all feel it. And reaffirm it. Reaffirm yourself that you belong. If you don't know something, you will figure it out. You want to know why? Because you're in tech. You're in IT. You make miracles happen. You really do. How often have you been given an assignment and it almost seems impossible, but some way you figured it out. You probably jerry-rigged it and Franken-served it and you know, got all sorts of crazy stuff with Band-Aids and glue, but you made it work, right, for the business. You accomplished it. I tell people, you know what? That crazy script that you wrote that is probably not really supported, be proud of that because you accomplished something that was probably uh, near impossible, but you were able to do it. And then strike a pose. So what, what strike a pose means is there are different, there's different uh, postures that you can uh, do that actually help give you positive reinforcement. Sitting in a meeting, do you slouch or do you sit straight up? I always slouch. But if you sit straight up, you're actually more attentive. You're more alert. And there's actual feelings that happen. There's positive reinforcement. You're more confident. But if you're sitting in a meeting or in your chair and you sort of have a slouch, you kind of don't care, right? You're like, I'm just going to be there. Change your posture. And when you walk, walk straight with your shoulders up. Be proud. Think of this. So you have executives in a meeting. When they walk out, do they slouch or do they walk straight, tall, and confident? I'm sure some of them feel not so good when they're walking out of a meeting if it didn't go well, but they're still walking straight. And tall. And then fake it till you become it. So this talk is awesome by Amy Cuddy. I recommend it to everybody. She really, really hear this talk. Uh, she talks about the different poses you can do, the power pose, the superwoman pose, raising your arms, and it actually does work. I do it all the time. I stand in a stance. It actually makes me feel more confident. But I highly recommend everyone to watch this. It's, it's amazing. Uh, she really touches on just how changing your posture, changing your, your attitude, even though you may not feel it at the time, eventually you become it. It's kind of like uh, the train that could. Yes, I can do it. Yes, I can do it. You keep telling yourself that. You do eventually become it. It's that positive thinking. And then balance. And this balance is just not, you know, balance with work and life. It's, it's mental balance. It's all of it, work-life balance. This is huge right now. Most people have been burnt out at some point in their career because you've been overworked, uh, you know, stressed, working long hours, not taking your breaks. You have to take your breaks. Think about your computer. If you run the Windows, how often do you have to reboot it for it to refresh? Make it, you know, run a little faster, right? You gotta do it at least once every so often. Your bodies need that. You need a break. You need, you need some time to disconnect. Not just from work, but also electronics too. We all need to disengage every so often. It will help you physically, but mentally. So burnout has actually been uh, recognized by the, who? the World Health Organization as an official syndrome. That's pretty huge. I mean, people are burned out, and it's just not in tech. It's everywhere. We are just so connected all the time. We, co we, need, we have this constant need to be connected. But a lot of us, because of imposter syndrome, we're constantly working harder and harder trying to prove to somebody, to ourselves and to others. So it's, just, it's, a, it's a vicious cycle, right? You're working harder and harder, and then now you're burning yourself out. 
Are you taking your breaks? And then when you are taking breaks, are you actually disengaging? So I've been burned out multiple times. And I don't say the last time I was burned out, but the first time when I really, really realized it was when my kids were younger. Now my 12-year-old daughter is sitting right there. And at the time, I was just present for her. And I was present for my other kids. I was there physically, but I wasn't present, present. I was on my phone working all the time. I mean, my kids, if you ask them, what did your mom do? Oh, yeah, she, she works. That's all she does is work. In my mind, I was working to provide for them, but I wasn't there. And I absolutely regret it because kids grow up. They grow up too fast. And you can't go back in time. There's no time machine. And it's just not about being present for your family, but yourself. People have gotten sick from burnout. Like it, it affects you physically. I've gotten sick from it. So I encourage everyone, take your breaks. But burnout also causes depression when you're just super stressed. And we've actually, I, I've lost some friends in the industry that have taken their own lives. They've gotten to a, they got to a point where it just was too much. And that's why I talk about this, because I don't want that to happen to anybody else. We can help prevent it. We can help each other. So if you are at that point where it's, you're just very, very low, I encourage you to seek help because I'm not a healthcare professional, but you should talk to somebody. And then how can we support each other? Support your team, because guaranteed, there's probably somebody in your team that might be getting burned out. Someone that is, you know, we start to get a little cynical sometimes, a little overworked, too many projects. Let's support each other. If you notice someone, that's maybe behaving a little differently, talk to them. Hey, let's go have a coffee. How's it going? Anything you want to talk about? You seem kind of off. That actually happened to me back in March. I was doing Microsoft Ignite the Tour. I'm not sure if you've heard of it. Uh, we were going out and doing a whole bunch of presentations and you know, six, we did what, 17 countries in six months. It was exhausting. And my manager said, why don't you take a break? I had two more cities. And I actually fought it. I'm like, no, no, I can do this, I can do this. He goes, you know what, I, I, I think you're, you seem overstressed. I was, I was very stressed out. And I fought it, I was defensive because he was taking something away from me. And eventually I caved in and uh, I took the break. I canceled the one city and it was good. And then I realized, you know, I'm gonna cancel the last city. I realized that I was burned out. I was very stressed out. It was affecting my health. I had headaches two months straight every single day. And when I took that break, wow. I stopped taking, you know, aspirin. Like I was taking aspirin, ibuprofen, extra strength Tylenol, all three, cocktail mix, just for me to be able to think. And I did that for two months. Yeah. I'm so glad I, I took the break and I actually thanked him for it, for identifying that I was getting burned out. So if you see someone, ask them, hey, let's talk. And if you're a manager, maybe offload someone at work. And we also want to, so we want to respect each other's time, right? Respect comes with the burnout. So you don't need to always be connected. So I actually have this tagline on my, on my signature, my email, because everyone always feels like they need to be connected. You get an email at two in the morning, do you have to reply? No, you don't. And we shouldn't expect that. We should not expect that of our employees. I get the emergencies, I totally get it. I've been on call, fires happen, but if you're doing it every day, 
that's not cool. So when you do send those late night emails, because people work on different hours, you know, let them know that respond when, you, when you're working. Respect their time off. So this signature has actually started like going viral in our org. And people take, they take it seriously. If you're not working, no need to respond yet. Just get back to me. And I absolutely respect that when people do that. And when they're away, I'm not gonna bother them. It can wait. Soft skills, these are, it's human skills. It's those skills that you can't learn from a technical training book. It's communication, it's, you know, basically how to talk to each other, right? Empathy, collaboration. Traditionally, what everybody thinks of IT is we work in the basement in a dark corner with the lights off and all we do is just stare into the computer or we're crawling under desks plugging wires in. We're more than that. We're business analysts now. We need to work with the business in order to help them become successful. We need to provide solutions. I mean, that's our job ultimately is providing solutions. But we need to be able to talk to them. And soft skills is important just not for talking to business but your own teammates because you got to talk to your teammates. You work better together when you can actually, you know, listen. So instead of talking, let's listen to each other. Let's build those communication skills. So I've talked about those three pillars. And I talked about respect, communication skills, all that. When you have all that, you get the inclusion. It's not a cure-all, right? But for the most part, if we respect one another, respect each other's time, and just simple respect, do unto others as you want done unto you. You don't have to like that person. You don't have to be best friends. But if you respect their ideas and their opinions, it goes a long way. Because everybody deserves a seat at the table. I mean, there are times I may not get along with someone, but I'll listen to what they have to say. Because at some point, they're going to give me the same opportunity. And when you have everyone at the table, you make better products. You really do. Perfect example, these mics, the headsets. I used one in Paris that was just really clunky and it didn't fit my small Asian woman head. But it fit the, the old white dude head that I was with. And he actually said it. And, and the first thing he said when he started talking was, this is why we need inclusion. This is why we need more voices on, at the table. So others' opinions, others, uh, other people's ideas. That product was meant to fit in the guy's head. They didn't take into account a small person's head. So the microphone stuck out and it was just very odd. So when you have different ideas, different opinions, you make better products. You're actually making products that reflect the world, that reflect your customers. So respect and speak up. So speak up goes not just about speaking up about harassment if you're getting harassed, right? Or if you see an issue. But it's also the others around you, our allies. If you see something, speak up. Because if we don't speak up about things, we don't change anything. I mean, how would you be able to change something if you don't know about it? And then we have to make it better. This industry is just, it's tiring every time I, I hear about, you know, the Me Too's or another person burned out. We really do have to make it better. It's really for the kids, the future. If we don't change the way the industry is going, what type of industry will the children, the young generation, those two little girls, what are they gonna come into? Burned out adults, this you know, culture of you need to work 24 seven in order to survive, everyone being mean to each other, 
not respecting each other. We tell our kids that they need to respect each other at school, be kind, don't bully. But as adults, do we actually follow the same advice that we give our kids? We try to, but oftentimes, you know, I mean, if you look at the news, we're not. I know it seems really basic, but if we just respect each other and sort of follow what we tell our kids, you don't have to like them, right? But don't bully them. Be nice. Really goes a long way. We're changing the present for the future. So thank you, everyone. And then evaluate the session. All right, thank you. For those of you that are leaving, we have another, another speaker with us today, but thank you, Pamela, I really appreciate that um, session. That was very insightful, and thank you for your courage and your bravery uh, and being so real. Uh, our next speaker has probably traveled the furthest to be with us today, all the way from Johannesburg, and she's here. We're really fortunate to have her. Lindiwe Matlali is the CEO of Africa Teen Geeks. It's an award-winning nonprofit that provides computer science training to school learners and teachers across South Africa. And it teaches young children to code. Lindiwe works tirelessly to promote skills in, tech, in the tech industry amongst youth to give them a chance to succeed as they grow. She's here today to share some of her tools for non-designers through a VR game, and you won't believe this, but her daughter, Karabo, created it. So. I'm very excited to invite both of them to the stage. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Lindy Wei and Karabo. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for my slide to start. Um, what I'm here to talk about is um, really the lack of diversity in STEM, and specifically the lack of women in STEM, and even more specific, lack of women of color in STEM, and how we can change that, and the work that we have been doing in, in South Africa to, um, to change it. I think my clicker is working. Okay, from okay, cool. All right. Sorry. Africa Teen Geeks. We started Africa Teen. I started Africa Teen Geeks in 2014, um, and it's it started because I was um, at MIT at the time, um, and there was an 80-year-old girl that came and and presented an app that she had created. And as she was talking, I started googling what's happening at home, what's happening in South Africa, why don't we have eight girls that young being able to, to do that? And the stats were shocking. Um, only 10% of our schools in South Africa teach IT, and it's mainly for the last three years of high school. And um, what was even more shocking is that those schools are only in the affluent areas. So 90% of the schools in South Africa that don't teach tech are the schools that uh, people of color attend in disadvantaged communities. And um, the issue, it wasn't it's not really racism or anything like that, because of lack of um, infrastructure in our school, because of the legacy of, of apartheid. We don't have qualified teachers. A lot of our teachers can't even use you know, Microsoft Word 
So let alone, you can't, even if you went there and you tried to teach them to teach coding, they just don't, you know, it's a, it's a huge ask. And, and as I've been working with the kids, we started running the Saturday classes at um, one of South Africa's largest university, the University of South Africa. It's a distance um, university. So they've got labs in, in 24 cities in South Africa. And we started encouraging kids to come. Our classes are free, run by volunteers. And what was even more shocking for me, while you, know, you go, you tell people, there's the free, free classes, bring your kids, they can learn how to code. What happened was we went to one of the sessions, you go there, there's only about three kids. And you're thinking, you know, why? And, and we realized that having an opportunity is not the same as being people being able to actually access it. So we had to think of having this opportunity, how do we then make sure that these kids that we're trying to, to bring in, they come from disadvantaged communities, their parents are security guards, they are domestic workers, the lowest paid, they couldn't even afford the transport to pay to, for their kids to come to the classes. So our strategy had to change. And um, it started to, to say, we needed to think about, if you're gonna create an opportunity, how are you gonna make sure that everybody can access it? In South Africa right now, I'll tell you, it's one of the best place to be, you know, as a woman and a black woman, the best country where, you know, there's lots of opportunities that are there. And sometimes when you sit with people on the table, they'll tell you, you know, why are these people, especially when you talk about people who are poor, it's like, you know, why aren't they coming in? Like, you know, these opportunities are there, the, the government has the most women-friendly policies, but why aren't they taking advantage of them? And that what I, and I started working with the government um, five years ago and um, to introduce coding and robotics to our curriculum. But with the issues that I explained to you, and when I sat at the table and I realized the people that were making these policies were assuming that everybody has, you know, can access it. And, and the point was, if we're not at the table, there was no voice that can say, hey, you can't just say I'm gonna introduce coding to schools when 90% of our schools do not have computer labs. When 90% of our teachers, actually there was a, a shocking study that came out three, uh, three months ago actually, that found out teachers, um, grade three teachers, that will be K3 in the US, failed the, in, in a grade three English test. So how are you going to teaching the kids when you cannot even, you know, that's like you think there's no way you cannot pass a great, you know, a K3 test where you're a teacher, you've been teaching for like 20 or odd years because our teachers are also older. So that's also where the, the challenge is. When you go and say, we're gonna train and train teachers for IT, they don't show up. Why? They're scared. And, and one of the reasons they'll tell you is because the, the kids are so smart. They're gonna learn and they're gonna make fun of me. They're gonna realize that I don't know as much. So we had to look at how do you then create a curriculum that was inclusive? And, but also with the stats that you see on the board, like in the, the lack of diversity for women, how do you also then encourage these kids? Because for those schools that I mentioned, the 10% that do have infrastructure, only 20% of girls take um, computer science. So they've got the teachers, they've got the internet, they've got the computer, but girls don't do it. And what was the reason? And the reason really that, I've, um, that I found is, you know, mainly, Girls that are interested in STEM are often told that they inherited a male brain. You know, you are a, to you are a tomboy. You know, when my daughter Karawa, when was young, at about four, so she started loving this show, How It's Made, on BBC. So it's an engineering thing. And, and also when my husband was fixing a car, she was interested. She would go and go and say, and I started looking, you know, I wanted to encourage her to, to actually do that. And one day my sister was visiting me and she said, um, I think your daughter is a tomboy. Um, you need to be you, to do more. Why is she outside and start trying to work with your dad and not with you? Are you sure she's not gay you know, or, or lesbian? I'm like, you know, why would anybody think that? But unfortunately, that's a, a lot of that kind of stereotype that is out there. That if a girl is technical, if a girl wants to be an engineer and she starts being interested in those when they're young, then there must be something wrong with them. Why aren't you interested in you know watching YouTube about makeup and stuff? And, and, and that's, that's something that we had to, to change. But for me, is you, you cannot change that if, one, I believe, um, I think we know this, early exposure is very important. 
I love Serena Williams, you know, not because of what she's doing, she's amazing, but her story for me is what resonated with me, that her parent, really her father was the one who was, was very much involved when she was young in making sure that she could play tennis and become the star that we know. And for a lot of uh, people of color, for example, we don't have a lot of role models that you can say, hey, you know what, you can hear about a Mark Zuckerberg, you know, but she, he doesn't look like you. And his background, a lot of when you go to kids that are really poor, when you tell them, you can become the next Mark Zuckerberg, they tell you, well, Mark Zuckerberg doesn't live in a shack. Mark Zuckerberg, never, when he grew up, he didn't have to worry whether, where his next meal is gonna come from. You know, and, and, and having those people that can come and teach, so it's very, it's, 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 there's not a lot of them that you can put and say, hey, you know, there's a car maker that, you know, as, uh, you know, Michael Okimasona from Nigeria. We don't even have a car making company in Africa in general. So for me, it was, we had to look at how do we then bring them by, and for me, it was, we need to educate the parents. And by educating the parents, it's when you, you bring the parents in, they don't have to be technical, right? Because obviously, a lot of them, they're not that educated. So we had to teach, for example, we started a program called Need to Code. And that was really aimed at teaching girls um, Python through knitting. So we worked and we developed, but the, we had to teach the grandmothers and the mothers to be the one that teach the girls to knit and we teach them how that translates into coding. Because knitting and coding are, are very much alike. You know, it, it uses the same kinds of you know, loops and all of those things you can find, all those concepts that we teach in coding, you can find when you teach them how to knit. But those, it's, a, it's a feminine work and the parents, the grandmothers, they feel comfortable. And then we start then exposing them to say, Actually, these are the opportunities that are available for the girls. When they can need, you know, they learn how to need, they can code, but if they can code one day, they can work for the likes of Microsoft and they can earn a lot of money. And in African culture is that we have to look af after our parents. And um, there's actually a term in South Africa that is called black tax, that once you work, you don't just pay your tax to the government, you have to look after your mother, your, your sister, your brother. Basically, the first one to work, you must, look after everybody. And it can be very taxing. And so we started looking, this is something that the parents can be able to get involved and do. And I use also my um, experience being, um, you know, I don't code. I don't have a coding background. I started business and, and I've de deliberately decided that I wasn't going to learn how to code because when I speak to the parents and say, I don't code yet, my daughter is able to do what she's, she's been able to do. And two years ago, we started working with Unity because when I was teaching Karawa, she started um, learning uh, coding when she was six, when I started Africa Teen Geeks. So a lot of the work that I do and any curriculum that I find, I always test it with my kids and as they are like my guinea pig to see how, whether it's, it's gonna work or not. And, um, and I started getting really interested in virtual reality because VR for me was um, working with our school, our government, you know, um, also when it comes to science, only also 10% of our school have, 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 have science lab. And because of the amount of money it costs, our government is not, it's not something that they're going to fix tomorrow. We still have a lot of, of bread and butter issues. Like, you know, I don't know if, if some of you have learned, but two years ago we had a six-year-old boy that died going to the, to the toilet in a pit toilet. She basically, he basically drowned in a pit toilet at school. And those are issues that, you know, we have to start, start and address first. So putting together computer labs and even science lab, it's a nice to have, but not a necessity. We have to start by building that first. And um, so I started saying, you know what, we want to build a VR platform where we can get these kids, uh, specifically kids in, in townships and in rural areas, and teach them um, where they can perform science experience through VR. And I approached the company that does it, which I'm not going to name, but they focus at university level. And um, they said to me, no, we're not interested in primary and high schools. And I uh, started talking to different, a lot of companies that told me the same thing, that we're not gonna do that in primary. So I thought, you know what, I'm gonna do it. I'm just gonna figure out and I'm gonna do it. And as I was looking at getting people that can work with us, when there were very few um, companies in South Africa that actually develops for VR. And because there are few, they were very expensive. And because for us, it's not a profit making, it's something that we're building for our schools. And I know that our government was just definitely not gonna fund it because the media is probably gonna go 
you know, crazy when how do you build a VR platform when you don't, when your schools are dying trying to do the most basic human, you know, uh, uh, thing, like basically going to the toilet. So we started building it. And also I thought, for me it was, I wanted to build it, but I also wanted to look at how do we then create a pipeline of these kids and girls that can be able to build VR platforms so that I don't have to try and Google and find you know, uh, companies that are outside of, of South Africa. And we approached Unity, and we started by saying, we're going to build this VR platform, but we also have to, whatever we're creating, it has to be in a way that we can also use it as part of our curriculum and teach our kids about that. Because when Garabo started, all, all the courses that were available for VR on Coursera, on EDX, were at university level. So, you know, for her to have to start, it was very difficult. So she had to learn, um, you know, concepts that probably was, you know, too high for her at, at that level. So we started building it, and we, we will be piloting um, in our schools um, they, when they open in July, where our kids will not only be, you know, performing VR at, at schools, but as well, they will also be able to learn how to create those platforms. So um, Karabo is going to show you what um, she heard started, and um, this is a, a, her own initiative called Girls in VR that she started with an 80-year-old girl from Washington. I don't know if some of you are on Twitter, she's very active, uh, the, tiny, the tiny diplomat. Um, and another 12-year-old who's based in France, and then her in South Africa. And they are doing this, they're all remote, and all of them have never met face-to-face, -face. so they've met on social media, and you know they started uh, connecting using Skype, and uh, where they started talking about how they, they are going to, to build this, the, the girl, Girls in VR movement. And she's going to show you how she, um, she's currently working on a game that she created um, number one, she's still not that good in C, so she had to figure out how she can do the animation with her limited C you know, programming skills. And it's been also great just to watch how she's been able to find this information online. And you know, the importance of when, as parents, we encourage our kids what they, you know, what they would be, they are capable of. And so to say also, she did the scene last night, so she can ha handle a hackathon because she decided to create it last night, so <laughs> it's not that great. My dream is about skills and food coaching. I know that being chosen for the hunt in South Africa and the right to run is a big thing in school. I used to mix them up to get to animation for the game and I, I interested the character to an animation to where I work at. Let me help launch my character E. to move and to switch direction by using Playmaker. Playmaker is a tool on Unity used to program characters without having, having to... Hold it up. Without having to, to code on C. So you can find the Playmaker on the Asset Store and it costs so I have three characters in my team. It would be the rhino, the bad guy, the pumpkin hulk, <laughs> <laughs> and the E. So her job is to make sure that the he stays away from the rhino because if he does, uh, he's going to kill us. Unfortunately, I am not, I didn't go that far with it. He glitches when it shoots. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.